Thank you very much, Tracy, and thank you particularly to the Alzheimer's uh, Australia, Western Australia, for inviting me here. Um, it's just good. It's just really good to be talking to you all this morning about working in the community with people living with dementia. And particular thanks to Caroline, Jason and Rhonda, and to Tracy, Heather and Kate. Okay, so what I'm hoping to cover is trying to understand what good looks like in person-centred dementia care, for, particularly for people living in community. And I want to explore again, following on from Heather's lecture, about why person-centredness and why that's important, particularly uh, when we're uh, developing services for people living with dementia. And also to share with you some tools that we've developed that have helped us think about this more clearly. And I suppose the other thing that I would want to say as, 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 uh, as, as a build-up to this is that I come here today in humility. I'm not coming from the UK saying we have sorted out community services for people with dementia, because we certainly haven't. And what I'm coming with more is solidarity in that struggle, in recognising that this is a real challenge. You know, if we look at some of the struggles we've had in care homes and hospitals in helping people uh, uh, survive to live with dementia, when we trans try and translate some of those concepts into community settings, it becomes even more complicated. So part of my visit this week is to work with Jason and uh, Caroline and the team to really look at some of the ideas that we've developed and how we can perhaps share those across Australia and the UK for the benefit of both of our countries. This is my team at University of Worcester. We were established in 2009. We're a multi-professional group. We are a research centre within the University of Worcester. We, our strap line is about developing evidence-based, person-centred, practical ways to help people live well with dementia. Um, there's a lot of discussion around what person-centeredness means, how you do it. I'm completely with Heather on the, the, the idea that as soon as things get bumpy, we go for the next, the next new idea. New dawns in dementia are very common, you know? And it's really, I think, about we, we, have, we know what the basic principles are around person-centered care. What we need now is to really put them into practice and gather the evidence of what really helps and what really works. We're a, a, a multi-professional group. Uh, mo many of us have come into research after having a, a, a career is either in the NHS or in social care. Uh, I'm a university professor now, but my first job in care was as a nursing auxiliary working on a, on a ward for people with dementia when I was a student. So, you know, I think many of us have unusual roots into working in this field. And uh, as this is the inaugural meeting of this particular programme, you know, you're all here for a purpose today. You've all found your way into this room because you have a backstory around dementia care. One of the things that I think we in, in grave need of is tools for the journey, things that will really help. You know, there isn't a book you can pick up that tells you how to do dementia community care. And I think as in our terms of being person-centred, we need to recognise that for different sectors of our care workforce, we need to think about what tools really work for them. So we've got this little book here, which is a... a, a one of my newest publications, and that arose out of working with hard-pressed hospital staff, particularly nurses and uh, professions allied to medicine, about what they really needed to know, what would make them feel expert. You know, going on from uh, Heather's point, 
if you're in hospital and you've got a dementia and you've also got heart failure, if you've got broken neck or femur, you really need somebody who is expert at both dementia and helping you with your broken neck or femur. Our nursing colleagues were, were telling us on our courses that there was so much information out there they were totally overwhelmed. So although that book looks quite big there, that's it. <laughs> what our nursing colleagues wanted, it's very small print, you know, because these are young people with good eyes. <laughs> um, but they wanted something they keep in their handbag or keep in the desk drawer. And when they've got somebody that's been admitted with Wernicke's encephalopathy, they can quickly look it up. When they've got a patient who uh, is not consenting to treatment, they can look it up. When they need to assess pain, they can look it up. So that was really important for our nursing colleagues, a person-centred nursing approach to dementia. The doctors, okay, medical textbooks, they always look really big and daunting. But you ask any doctor what series they read in the UK, it's the ABC Guide. Now this is the Ladybird books of, of medicine. Lots of pictures, you know, small paragraphs. They all have a big series of these on their bookshelves because doctors have bookshelves. They don't have to keep it in their handbag or in the desk drawer. And we've just done one on dementia. So it's, again, I think thinking clearly about tools to, to really help. And I'm interested in thinking about what tools would really help in community. You know, we've got a lot of thought about, certainly in the UK, about whether we put things on tablets. You know, is that the, is that the way forward or not? Okay, the other thing that I just want to say as way of preamble is this is our link group who are people with dementia, people living with dementia and family carers, friends and supporters um, who work with us within the Association for Dementia Studies. These are people who are all local to our university, who act as tutors on our education courses and who work with us in our research projects. And I think very important to have the experience of people with dementia at the heart of what we do. And whenever we run an education programme on dementia, you know, I've got my lovely PhD qualified professional lecturers and on the evaluation forms people always write back, you know, it was a person with dementia that really struck home and made a difference, you know, as it will be today, I'm sure. And so having you know, building yourself a local community of, of people who are living with dementia, um, who are willing to, and brave enough and courageous enough to act as tutors and, inf you know, inform your work is so important. And certainly nationally within the UK, um, we've got many real champions of uh, people living with dementia who can really tell us what good looks like and what it doesn't look like. And I know this afternoon we've got an expert panel around that. Okay, this is a dense slide. This was me trying to put on one slide some of the issues that I think are important. If we're thinking about living in the community, what's important? And these are some of the setting conditions. Dementia covers a complex range of different syndromes. Some of them are very rare, you know. Estimates around 150, 200 types of dementia. Most of us never come across more than Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, and frontotemporal dementia, but there are many more. And the diagnosis of, 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 of that is complicated. And dementia often happens to people who are also experiencing other health and social changes at the same time. So it's a complicated picture. And our health and social care services aim to support people and their families through targeted case detection, timely diagnosis, post-diagnostic support and adjustment, often a progressive and unpredictable loss of functioning, Adjusting to help at home, changing lifestyle needs, hospitalisation, housing support, care home admission and complex end of life care. And all of this needs to be done with due respect and sensitivity to the person's lifestyle and to the context of the community in which they live. And I think if we start setting out the complexity, it's no wonder a lot of us feel pretty exhausted 
you know, and pretty overwhelmed. Because that's a really big challenge to tackle. It's not something that's going to be solved by tender loving care and training a lot of volunteers. You know, this is complicated stuff that we're about and why I think it's really good that we're taking it so seriously here. Because it's so complicated, sometimes I think imagining using a metaphor or a picture to help us think about that complexity can sometimes help cut through this. And the metaphor that we've been working with at Worcester is the one of a, of a, a long and winding river journey. And if we think about the person with dementia and their family are the folk in the boat, the folk in the raft. So um, stay with me on this because we often think about dementia as a pathway, but paths are a little bit more predictable sometimes than, than river journeys. So if we think about what happens at diagnosis, for example, that can feel like you're falling off the waterfall. It's D-Day, you know. Before you get to that waterfall, there's been a lot of eddies and swirls that have been going around at the top, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of what-ifs. And then recognising that people will, their lives are turned upside down around dementia diagnosis. And it's what we do when people in the boat hit the bottom of that waterfall. That will often be what makes a difference to how well they can navigate the rest of the journey. So who's standing, you know, who's there at the bottom of the waterfall and at the top and trying to, to make that journey less, uh, less traumatic? How can we steer people into the clear and calm waters? And also recognising that we know as the dementia journey progresses, there are rocks in the way. You know, when people start to lose the ability to, to pr do personal care for themselves, for example, we know that's a real big rocky time. So who's standing on the bridge watching out for people hitting the rocks? Who's going to get in the boat with people? You know, who's going to help if the boat needs to come out of the river for a while, if we need to have hospitalisation or, or care home admission, and how do we get the boat back on? So I would offer you that, that sort of white water rafting journey as a way of helping you think about what your journey for the folk who are in that boat looks like in WA, you know, and how each of us has to play our part in supporting people through it. And further thinking about how we compartmentalise that up, you know, if we think about the waters, we want to get those as clean and as calm as we can. And I think if we conceptualise that about community, you know, building communities that are dementia friendly, where dementia is not stigmatised, where people can continue to use the same facilities as everybody else, have equal rights as citizens, where people can have fun, have a family life, how schools react, how businesses react, employers, churches, temples, synagogues, mosques, you know. There's a huge amount of work we can do to make that river better to be in. And then navigating the river, social care primarily, providing sensitive, good quality care that supports the whole family to carry on and not get overwhelmed. Information, education, finances, legal, signposting, technology, adjusting, giving support, giving hugs, getting the counselling, peer support, getting a break, getting help at home. And then our healthcare, you know, what happens when the boat hits the rocks? Timely diagnosis, comorbidities, therapy, interventions, pharmacological, non-pharmacological, support in a crisis, support in complexity. You see where I'm going? So it's like recognising what your bit is of that, doing it really well, and understanding what the other bits are uh, that need to go alongside it. And certainly in the UK, and I think here, we've got a lot of um, initiatives now around dementia-friendly communities, and that's been so important for us. I don't know how it's working for you, but it's been really important for us uh, in terms of improving quality of life and decreasing stigma. And I think we've got a, a, a good way to go with this. I don't know whether you can 
see this. Uh, this was a, 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 an innovative pub in Yorkshire that was obviously touting for business, uh, the Oaks in Ramsbottom. Husband daycare centre. Need time to relax? Want to go shopping? To keep time to yourself? Leave your husband with us. You only pay for food and drink. You know, and wouldn't it have been great if there was a Dementia Friends sticker on the top of there as well? You know, it's about helping these community action become much more dementia focused and dementia friendly. And I think we've only just started to sort of tap the, uh, tap the water with that one. Living well initiatives, navigating that whole social care. We have got lots of new initiatives popping up in this field. A lot of them are from third sector charity organisations or people that really want to make a difference locally. Um, we've no, there's no shortage of different initiatives. And I, I'm thinking that, again, that's something that's similar in Australia. And it, it's, again, from, I suppose, my point of view as a researcher, knowing what works and what doesn't work, making sure we're not giving people false hope, but really recognising that the diagnosis is just the start of the journey. It's what happens afterwards. It's the then what, the so what, that we need to get right. So there's a lot of work that I think we can take forward and draw inter international inspiration from uh, for what you're doing here. And then there's the sort of more traditional complex care, you know, that I suppose we're more used to thinking about in terms of health care for people with dementia. But recognising, you know, that even our experts are woefully not expert in this area. And if you're working um, with comorbidities and physical health and dementia, you know, people are amazed at what they can find out. Yeah. And it doesn't take much to give people that expertise and that, that help, but there isn't a, you know, we need to think about how that happens. It, it won't happen by, by chance. So it's about being competent at core business. You know, home care, daycare, care homes and hospitals. We should be able to provide a good enough quality of person-centred care so that the chances of the person with dementia experiencing distress because of poor care is minimal. And going back to Kate's point about the sort of challenging behaviour label, a lot of so-called challenging behaviour that we see is because of poor care. You know? And if we can just eliminate that, we'd be doing a much, much better job than we currently are. But it's also recognising that even if we get our person-centred care great in our dom care or our day care, that dementia is a complex set of disorders and people have complex lives and histories and distress will be there. So it's recognising that if you're working in the dementia care field and you've done all your person-centredness, you've been proactive, you've got things as good as they can be, that you will still come across situations where you feel out your depth. And in those cases, you should know who you call on. You know, you should be able to get help quickly, whether you're a family member or whether you're going in to see somebody at home. And I put this patient up... Uh, this lady, Mrs Jones, who was a patient with dementia on an acute hospital ward, D22, in Wolverhampton in 2011. An acute hospital ward. She has advanced dementia, she also has cancer, and she needs to be in hospital. You can tell from her face she's poorly. You know, she's proper poorly. Mrs Jones doesn't know she's poorly, actually though she just wants to go home. And certainly two years earlier on that sort of ward, they would have been calling security to get, her, you know, to sort her out because she was trying to get out of the, the ward. Now the ward is geared up to looking after her. So she's in clothes that are hers. She has her Bon Tempe organ from home, which she really likes doing. And you'll notice the sharp eyed amongst you that she has lovely red fingernails. She's had a manicure. <laughs> You know, and if we can do this in an acute hospital ward, we can surely get that sort of care right in people's own homes. 
Why person-centred? I think that the issue about, that Heather touched on earlier, about the roots of person-centredness, I think in the dementia care field, we have moved quite quickly from thinking about dementia as the death that leaves the body behind into living well with dementia. You know, that has certainly been in my career and I would suspect a number of people in the room when we first came into health or social care, that was the picture. And recognising that people have a life to, to live is still a relatively new development in dementia care. Okay, I just want to think about why it's so difficult to get it into practice. So I'm also conscious of time. I've talked a little bit about that, you know, that, that we have significant challenges still about helping people live well with dementia. And some of that is about both lack of competence and skills, but around leadership and knowledge in health and social care. An underlying reason for that, certainly in the UK, is funding. You know, it's never been an area that's attracted a lot of funding or status. And the structure of our health and social care are not designed to, to deal with people with long-term conditions. So we're, we're up against a, a, a challenge before we start. But I think the other thing that we have to name is the issue of prejudice, fear and stigma. And certainly, Kate's brilliant lecture on the underpinning language feeds into that. And the other thing that we know about prejudice and fear and stigma is that it increases in times of austerity. And we're facing certainly an economic downturn. So we see the rise of, of prejudice in all sorts of ways. And if we're not very careful, people with dementia or older people will be blamed for the fact that services are so poor. You know, there's a, there's a nasty, if we think about that river, we may have a perfect storm whipping up around blaming the people who are getting the poor quality services for the fact that they're getting poor quality services. So if we are gonna work in this arena, we have to be very clear that dementiarism exists and that it's often very difficult to talk about for ourselves, for our families, for our employees. And so navigating our way through helping people who have particular needs and, and balancing that up with their rights, that's a tricky one to navigate. And we have to get better at it. We have to get to be better nav navigators. And often those prejudices are deep-seated, they're not always in our conscious awareness, and we are all a project of our culture and our context, as Heather said. You know, so if in my background, my professional training was about the death that leaves the body behind, you know, that's in there. That is a, it's quite a deep-seated thing. And so I think if you're working in this field, particularly if you are working as a leader in this field, you have to root out and name your own prejudices and think about that carefully because organisations will take on the quality of their leaders. And I think there are often times where we're training lots of dementia champions, dementia awareness, dementia friends, and you see at the top of the organisation actually there's still quite a lot of prejudice and fear and stigma going on. You know, so it's about us as being grown up and looking at our, our own prejudices as well. And I think these are the sort of, if I'm talk with a care team and I start hearing these sorts of phrases, these are the ones that make me think, okay, what's going on in the culture here? What's the point? They won't remember. This is a bit of a waste of resource. They're blocking beds for more important patients. They are not our patients' responsibility, funding stream. I'm too, not enough time, I'm too busy saving lives. You know, those are the sort of little phrases 
and I can see some nods in the room, you know, if they're around in your organisation, those are often the ones where you say, well, hang on, let's just think about what we're saying here. Yeah. So I just offer that. That's the first time I've shared this slide anywhere. I thought I'd try it out in Australia before I took it back to the UK. <laughs> OK, so person-centred care and frontline services. People with dementia, we have to recognise, have a high risk of not being treated as full citizens, high risk of being ignored, high risk of being abused. People with dementia often have particular disabilities around communication, strong emotional responses, and a major need for continuity and to feel connected to others. And both of those things, as the dementia progresses, become more important. Yes, yeah, so we've got a timeline happening there. And services need to respond to both of those needs. Oh, crikey. I'm not doing well on the old technology. Person-centred services need to respond to those needs in a proactive fashion. So if we're really building a person-centred community service, we need to look at both of those top two points and think about how we build in things that mean we meet people's needs before they ask. Tom Kitwood. I even got a picture of him. There you go. Professor Tom Kitwood, certainly in terms of talking about person-centred care, produced a series of papers in the late, nine, late 80s and throughout the 90s, drawing on the work primarily of Martin Buber and Carl Rogers, so coming from quite a different route. And the book that he wrote, Dementia Reconsidered, The Person Comes First. If you haven't read it, it's still a classic. The stuff that Tom wrote about in 1997 is still as relevant today as it, as it was then. And he gave us some very powerful tools and frameworks for thinking about dementia. He talked about the enriched model of dementia and supporting personhood through the eradication of malignant social psychology. Now, both of those last two lines they're a day's workshop in themselves, so I'm not going to go on to that, but it would be this, those are the sorts of things that we would be expecting a dementia specialist service to, to really understand, and I'm sure the sorts of things that you would cover in your training. Tom uh, died the year after that book was, uh, was written, and one of the things that um, I took on and uh, have continued to work with, with colleagues, is trying to, to change and translate some of that very erudite theoretical standpoint into practical tools and recognising that we need to know what good looks like. And who has to do what to make it happen? And I wrote this little green book, Person-Centred Care, looking at VIPs, the VIPs framework, to really try and get underneath some of those tricky issues in who has to do what in order to make person-centred care happen. This takes a, a definition, a four-point part definition of person-centred care, which absolutely mirrors the one that, that Heather put up earlier. Person-centred care is care that values people regardless of age or cognitive ability. It responds to the individuals. It recognises that all of us um, are individuals with a, a bag load of vulnerabilities and a bag load of abilities. It takes the perspective of the service user as its starting point and it provides a socially supportive psychological milieu, so it helps the person not feel alone. And certainly within our uh, Nice Sky guidelines on dementia uh, in 2006, which was really important for us in the UK about getting our national dementia strategy on the line, um, 
they took the, the, the VIP's definition of person-centeredness, which values and promotes the rights of the person, that provides individualised care according to needs, that understands care from the perspective of the person with dementia, and provides a social environment that enables that person to remain in relationship with others. VIPS, care fit for VIPs. It's a, a quicker way of remembering what's important. And in our own work, you know, you can use that VIPs framework to think, to their guiding principles. You don't do person-centered care, you don't get to that, you don't do that sort of, you know, um, person-centered care isn't a single action. It's about how we are with the people uh, that we're privileged to, to help. Do my actions show that I respect, value and honor this person? Am I treating this person as a unique individual? Am I making a serious attempt to see my actions from the perspective of the person that I'm trying to help? And how might my actions be interpreted by them? And do my actions help this person to feel socially confident and that they're not alone? And those guiding principles work if you are helping somebody use the toilet, if you're giving them an injection, if you're running a, a life story group, if you're playing bingo, you know, it's not about the actual task that you're doing, it's the way in which you do it. And you'll also notice that there is no dementia word in there. You know, these are pretty straightforward guiding principles for how we are with everyone. You know, it's a code that works if you're thinking about your staff team, your family, you know, they're, they're good, integrative, positive psychology type principles. And the next phase then was to think about go, moving from an individual code of practice to trying to think across the care organisation about whose job it is to do what within a care provider organisation. And I worked very closely with um, uh, people in different countries uh, who were working in the sort of Tom Kitwood manner around person-centred care to help try to say, okay, so what are the indicators? If you go to see a, a, a care provider, whether that's a care, care home or a dom care or daycare, what are the indicators that valuing people are really in place? What are the indicators for showing that individualised care is really in place? What are the indicators for showing that the organisation takes the perspective of people seriously? And, and what are the indicators for social psychology? And so these six indicators for each of those VIP and S were derived through a, a series of, of working with people who were working at the cutting edge of trying to provide good quality person-centred care. And this has become, within the, the Green Book, this is the, the, pers the, the Care Fit for VIPs framework to really help us stop feeling so overwhelmed by how tricky person-centred care is and to put it down into sort of bite-sized bits. So if we think about your own care organisation, there will be things that you do really well and things that you don't do so well. And so part of the VIPs framework is taking a step back with your top team, with your shift leaders, with people who use the service, and to have a look at how well you're doing on each of those indicators. And by doing that, you build up a profile of what you do well, what you don't do so well. And through discussion, then you build up a way of thinking, well, if we were going to change a couple of things, what's, what's within our sphere of influence to change and what would make a major difference to people? So indicators of valuing. Is every life precious? Do staff feel valued? You know, we know certainly from research, if you look at what improves 
satisfaction of your service users, it will be job satisfaction of your staff. So if you want them to feel, if they want to value their clients, if they want to take care to get that washing properly hung out, they have to feel taken care of themselves. Can staff act in best interests of service users? You know, on a sunny day, can we go outside? Or do I have to fill out a form in triplicate to allow us to open the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the windows? Do we have a skilled workforce? You know, are we employing the right people doing the right job with the right training, with the right induction? Who, what are our physical and social care environments? Are we paying attention to those? And do we have quality assurance processes that tell us what our service users think of our, of our service? How are we doing on those six indicators? Excellent, good, okay, need serious work. Key personnel who set the value in stuff is usually your boss, it's your top team. You know, if, if they're not on board with those things, you won't employ the right staff, you won't get the right contracts, you won't do the right Q&A. You know, so that's the, uh, that's the key mover. And if you're a boss of an organisation, that's your job. Individualised approach. Care planning across all needs, care plans that are responsive to change, people using personal clothing and possessions, recognising that continuity is really important for people who are feeling... Um, uh, cut adrift. Do staff know about individual preferences and routines? Do they know individuals' key stories of proud times? Is there a range of occupation activities that really help people feel connected and having fun? Excellent, good, okay, need serious work. Key personnel here are your care leader, your team leader, team manager. These things don't happen by chance, you know. They all require processes putting in place that somebody has to organise and think about who does what when. So it's your clinical care type leader who really needs to understand this raft of things and take a leadership role um, in getting this done. The pictures, by the way, picture, the last picture was Professor Alistair Burns, who's the boss of dementia in the UK. Uh, this is my husband, who's a care leader at a football match. <laughs> okay, indicator taking the perspective. Are our staff skilled communicators? Are they able to do that balance between empathy and risk? Do they manage people's comfort needs, emotional and physical, on a day-to-day -day basis? Do they anticipate physical health needs and recognise when people are, are having physical health problems that will compromise their well-being? Do they see, do we see challenging behaviour as a communication? Is that, your, you know, is that, our, is, is that how we uh, operate or do we blame people for their distressed behaviours? and our staff are able to advocate on behalf of the person whose needs may be at odds with other more powerful people around them. Excellent, good, okay, needing serious work. And those sort of perspective indicators are your shift leader or your team leader. So those are the, the, the leadership there is the person who directly manages your frontline staff because they will set the tone around whether these happen or not. Um, this is a, a proud moment for me. This was, oh, go back. Sorry. Um, this is a, a hospital in Portsmouth that has a Kitwood Ward and a Brook Award. I was very proud to have that named after me, except then was told the Brook Award was the challenging behaviour unit. So I thought, <laughs> okay, there you go, there you go. But it's your shift leaders, you know, in a hospital, it's, your, it's your, 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 your senior nurse in charge. In your care home, it's the person managing the shift. In dom care, it's the person who's managing the team who's going out into the, into the, the care, to deliver care. And then the social psychological support. This is going back to Kitwood stuff around malignant social psychology and ensuring that in every interaction we have a positive social, psychological uh, interaction. 
So are our service users included in conversation or are they talked over? Are they met with respect or are they disregarded? Is there a feeling of warmth or coldness? Is distress taken seriously or is it ignored and marginalised? Do we help people to do and to live or do we do things to them? And are we helping people to remain part of a community or does it feel like an institution? And, and you will know community can feel like an institution if you've got you know, 10 people with keys coming into your home, it can start to feel institutionalised. Excellent, good, okay, need serious work. And this is your frontline staff. This is what everybody needs to be able to do. And, and this was taken on Brooke Award, and the, the sharp-eyed amongst you will see that not only have I got a ward named after me, I've got a bucket with my name on. <laughs> so this is the Brooke, Brooke bucket to stop it getting mixed up with any other bucket. And uh, the embarrassed guy with the bucket is obviously thinking, what the hell is this woman having his photo take, her photo taken with me? But if the guy with the bucket doesn't know how to do that, and he's the one who will have most contact with patients on a, a, in, in the ward situation, then we can have all of our fancy value base, but then person-centred care falls down. So I offer you VIP's framework as a, as a way forward. In terms of trying to get this into a practical tool, there is a website, it is free, you can go on it today. Um, there are no adverts. We developed it primarily because we got some funding uh, from a care homes project. So the first iteration of Care Fit for VIP's website was for care homes. We're very excited in that we've just developed um, one for domiciliary care and one for daycare. And when you go on the website, you have to register for the specific one that you're interested in. It's a bit complicated in terms of um, if you've registered for one already, you have to use a different email address for the, the one that you want now. So just be warned on that. But we're getting there. And what the website gives you is more than the book. Um, It gives you a real-time assessment tool, so it takes you through those 24 indicators and you can fill in how you think you're doing and it gives you some extra prompts to, to help you think about how well you think you're doing on, on those particular indicators. It then gives you a, a nice little improvement cycle, so if you decide, okay, we, what we really want to work on is um, physical health or we want to work on um, activities, it gives you a you know, plan, do, study, act cycle and you can monitor uh, your, your action going forward. But the really interesting bit, I think, is the searchable toolkit. So what you've also got on there for each of those indicators is web links to other resources. So that if you do want to do improvement in a particular area, we've taken some of the web link work out for you in that you can click on YouTube clips, books, resources, things that will help you uh, to, to improve in a particular area. Um, and you've, I've just put up some of the, uh, the pages here. So this would be domiciliary care S5, um, which is about uh, enabling people to, uh, uh, you know, do we enable people or do we do things to people? So as you can see, you've got a, a checklist of, of different questions to help you think this through. And the way in which we usually advise people, use, uh, people to use is, as I said, get together a group, a representative sample of your senior staff, your frontline staff, service users and families to help you think about it. It's not designed to be a, a tick box that you have to pass or fail. It's there to help you sort of get the conversation going. Activity and occupation, so things to think about um, and to create an, an improvement cycle. Day centres, that's one about the, 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 physical, the physical environment in day centres. So I just put a few screens up there. But those of you who have still got your phones on, you can go on register now and have a look if, if you like. Okay. I'm going to 
finish um, showing a, a, a series of photographs of May Williams, um, who, and these photographs are from a care home, but they could equally be from people who you're looking after in the community. May um, is a lady with vascular dementia, pretty advanced. She also had a chest infection that developed into pneumonia and was admitted to the local hospital from home. And uh, she was in the hospital for seven weeks and she was admitted to the Lady Forrester Care Home with the fantastic person-centred care plan, all needs, no mobility, not eating. So this was what the care home got as the, the care plan introduction to May. Essentially, she had been sent to the Lady Forrester home um, to pass away, you know, because she was blocking a bed for more important patients still in the, in the hospital. Lady Forrester uh, certainly used the, the person-centred VIPs model. It's a nice home, it's a small home, uh, and with good values. So this is her six days after admission to the care home. She's up and dressed, looking a bit dishevelled, but certainly very interested in what the, uh, the young woman has in her hands. One month later, we have some baking going on. May is a homemaker. She no longer can cook a, a full dinner or do a big cake. But certainly if you put some flapjack mixture in May's hand, she's, it's a very familiar activity for her. And good health and safety, you know, she's got her plastic gloves on, but even with the plastic gloves on, she's, you know, she's doing something that, that feels real. Um, six weeks later, we're having an Italian meal, and certainly she's looking much fuller in the face now. She's had her hair done, and uh, she certainly looks like she's ready to do some eating. Um, and a themed evening around Italian dining. Six weeks later again, tea and teddy. And this might be where we get stuck on the social role valorisation stuff. But, you know, for again, this is a, a very happy looking lady. Two months later, Indian head massage. Now, I'm, I'm sure May has never had an Indian head massage in her life before, but, you know, you can see the, 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 the joy. So. It's old experiences, but also new experiences. Old skills returning. Again, she's a, a, long, a lifelong knitter. She can't do a fair aisle jumper anymore, but she certainly knows what to do with wool and knitting needles, and that feels a very familiar place for, uh, uh, for, for May to be. Silk scarves, so working in this home does a lot of work around sensory activities, so I'm not sure whether they do play the bingo, but they certainly do a lot of stuff that's, that's around helping activities that are appropriate and adult uh, for, the, for their residents. And three months later, dancing to music, so she's up. And here we have a, and a Mexican celebration. I think these photos might have been taken during the World Cup because there, certainly there seem to be quite a lot of uh, World Cup team themes going on. So this is three months after all needs, no mobility, not eating. You know, this care home wasn't doing anything magic. You know, they were putting into place good person-centred care. And if you talk to the care staff, they wouldn't realise what it was they were doing. Yeah, we didn't do anything different with May. And actually, the beauty of taking these photos, the biggest thing was showing those back to the care staff, you know, in terms of helping them feel that they were doing a, a, a job well done. And, and something I think that we don't do enough of, you know, that very simple, just you would be working with people in the community whose lives you transform all the time, who you, workers transform lives. And having that on record is so important in terms of staff's own job satisfaction and family's, job, uh, family's satisfaction. Okay. So I'll put up a few different websites. 
If you go onto our website at, uh, at University of Worcester, you'll, you'll come across a wealth of things, as I'm sure you will, uh, from local websites. Thank you very much. Thank you.